Good morning, everybody. Great to see you here this morning. Two quick things before I add to that. Number one, notice there are no blue tape strips. Praise God for that. We, we are able, uh, able to increase our, uh, our capacity, and so we're going to trust you to do what you feel comfortable with and what is right, and so we're so thankful for that. Secondly, if you're a guest with us this morning for the first time, you notice that part of your bulletin uh, has, is perforated. There's a place for you to some, fill out some info on that. If you do us a favor and do that and tear that thing off, and when you leave today at either main door, there are buckets uh, where the offering is being given, and you can just drop them that bucket, and we would really appreciate that. Now, about the video just you just saw, remind you that we continue our Reach Texas missions offering that continues through the end of this month, and that is an, part of what we get to be a part of, ministering, and, and imagine how many thousands of young people, they had the opportunity to reach for Christ, and then where they go, Texas, outside of Texas, around the world. What an amazing opportunity. We get a chance to pray, but we get a chance to be a part of that financially as well. So please give as the Lord leads you. Uh, we still have the special offering envelopes for that offering. And then tonight, 5.30, I know we've done the Reach Texas Roundup before. Tonight is the Armadillo Race. Now, I don't normally bring my cell phone into the worship center, but I have done so because I wanted to be able to share this with you directly. I wish I would gotten the picture up in time, but they're, they're, the Armadillo race, what, what's going to happen is we're going to have a fellowship time outside. It's going to be in the parking area, so bring folding chairs with you you use outside. If you don't, we do have uh, some folding metal chairs that we can use. There's going to be grilling going on, hot dogs, hamburgers, all the food's going to be provided, so you don't have to worry about any of that. There's going to be some hay rides. There's going to be face painting, I think, and some other things. There's going to be, I saw a dunking booth. Not sure about that dunking booth right now. It's someone mentioned, yeah, and I, 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 I personally am not sure anyone here has enough of an arm to hit that. So I'm just saying that. Thought I'd throw that out. So we'll, we'll see about that. But anyway, but any, just, just like the Reach Texas Roundup, any money that's raised during that time goes directly to that state missions. Now, there's going to be an armadillo race. No, I did not capture the armadillos, nor did I find them on the road or anything else. There are armadillos. There are going to be several armadillos, and they're, so help me, I'm, I'm reading this. There, we need jockeys for the armadillos. Someone asked me, Jody, someone asked this in the first service. I heard Jody's going to be riding an armadillo. I said I can neither confirm nor deny. Okay, so that's out. She's denying it, but... However, it says, so bring money to nominate your favorite jockey and bring money to buy votes for your armadillo to win. Yes, buying votes will be completely legal. So I'm, I'm just, you know, in this situation, it's completely legal. So uh, anyway, we're going to have a great time. It starts at 5.30 tonight. Come and join us and be a part of this. We're looking forward to it. The Reynolds Family Band is going to be playing. That's what the uh, stage is set up out there for. Uh, actually, the trailer. We're calling it a stage, but it still looks like a trailer to me. But it's going to work. And so we're looking forward to that. So we're going to have a great time tonight. So as we begin, let's, let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love and care for us. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of what this couple we just saw is doing at Texas State in San Marcos. Others, Father, we've learned about Brownsville and other areas where ministry is going on around our state, and if it's going on around Texas, it's going on around the world. Father, what a great blessing. Pray that as we continue to give, you will bless. And Lord, as we lift them up, we pray that you would continue to work through them. And today, Show us how we can be a part of that, how you can use us for kingdom work. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the love that God has for us. The psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Today, let's stand as we give thanks to our God and worship him. good when there's nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are 
light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true. Even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life. In you, death has lost its sting. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever reign. You are more sorrows and he made them his very own he bore my burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous Something 
up for me. separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword no for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any anything else under heaven shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord amen and on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten, ten thousand years and then forevermore. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh, oh, oh my soul Worship His holy Sing like never before, oh 
not working? Well, I'm not singing it a cappella. What's up with it? Oh well. Why don't we do this? How, how, how about we'll we'll bow to to the technical difficulty for the moment. If they get it figured out, then how about you sing after the message? How's that sound? Sure. She's like. <laughs> oh man, sorry about that. Gracious. Technology is such a wonderful thing. Not. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes it can be a great thing, and sometimes it can be so frustrating. I was telling someone just earlier, I know you've seen the commercial, the, I think it's Domino's Pizza, where they're talking about how they were trying to come up with new ways to deliver pizza, and apparently somebody decided to Frisbee pizza. If you ever see a phone flying, it's, I'm the one that threw it. I'm just telling you, because one day I'm going to come to the conclusion that I want to see how far my smartphone will fly, because I've had this smartphone for three years, and I'm not any smarter because of it, and now Doug says it's ready to go. My goodness. I'll tell you what, if you don't, do you want to come back, try it again? You want to give it a shot, or do you want to wait? Okay, she, okay, he's got it up. He has promised within an inch of his life that... <laughs> We're going to give it another shot. from your love no sickness no secret no chain is strong enough to keep us from your love to keep us from
future our past is in your hands we're covered by your blood we're covered by your blood how high how wide no matter Thank you so much. Believe me, that, that kicks off the message and works out a whole lot better right there. So I'm glad they got that worked out. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 7. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 16 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 7. By the way, you might notice something's a little different this morning than it has been for a while. I decided to wear a tie today. haven't done that in a, in a while. You know, it was kind of the summertime, and now it's cooled off a little bit. And, and I have to confess, I got up this morning wondering if I could remember how to tie it. And uh, there's something about this rabbit that goes through a hole or, or something like that, but uh, I, I think I got it right. So it's a little different feeling, but had to, had to go back to one. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning of verse 12, Paul writes, so although I wrote to you It was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame, but just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have perfect confidence in you. Let's pray. Father... We thank you so much for the time we've had already to worship and glorify you. Now, focus our minds and hearts to hear your word. Speak to us, Father, in a clear, distinguishable fashion. Lord, we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can use us to make a difference in your kingdom. 
Father, I pray for those here this morning who do not know you. Before we leave this place today, they might know there's a place for them in your kingdom as well. And for those of us, Father, who have a personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, may we leave here today, Father, as people who know that, yes, we can make a difference. Well, we love you and we praise you. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Can God really use me? You know, that's a good question. Can God really use me? The, the answer is going to surprise you a little bit in that it, it's, it's not based on who you are. Because who we are has, has changed, and it's been changed by God. God has forgiven us. God has changed us. God has saved us. But in reality, the answer to that question, can God really use me, is based on who you think you're not. Now, hang with me on this a little bit, okay? Back in 2009, there was a movie made called Invictus. Invictus was the true story of the 1995 South African rugby team and their battle in the World Cup. Now, they were hosting that particular World Cup, so they had an automatic entry into that. They weren't the best team in the world. At least most people were sure of that. They certainly weren't the worst. But that was almost a sideline as to what was going on in the country at the time because Nelson Mandela was the president. And that was more about a nation and about a policy that had been known as apartheid. And there was an opportunity Mandela saw that this rugby team, with the world's attention on South Africa, had to bring about a healing. But some special things had to happen. And at one point in time, Mandela is talking to one of his aides, and he's talking about what possibility the team actually has to win or do anything in the cup. And he makes a statement, which is interesting because the word invictus, when it's translated, literally means undefeated. And you have to understand that, that this team was anything than, other than undefeated. But he makes a statement to one of his aides. He says, giving their all, meaning the players, will not be enough. More is needed. We need what they can't do. It's an interesting statement. Made me think about another movie that came out not too long around that time period. It was a little more fun of a movie, if you will, a movie called Cool Runnings. Don't know how many of you have seen that movie, but it's also based on a true story. It's based on a bobsled team from Jamaica. Go figure that. There were four sprinters from Jamaica who didn't make it to the Summer Olympics team, so they decided to have a bobsled team and go to the Winter Olympics. A bobsled team from Jamaica. Well, they managed to get to the Olympics, and they qualify and so forth. And, and things really change. They've got this rickety old sled they're riding in, but they actually become a team, and things begin to go well. And it comes down to the third and final race, and they actually have a chance to medal, maybe even do better than that. And so they take to the track, and they're flying around this track at unbelievable speeds, and that rickety sled begins to lose and wobble a little bit. And finally, they come around that last turn, and when they hit that last turn at breakneck speed, that thing flips over. And it begins sliding down the track. And, and there's this sudden stillness and silence among all the people as they watch this. And finally, it coasts to a stop. And the four men in there are just, just there. I mean, no one's really sure if they're okay or not. And then one of the characters in there, his name is Sanka. Sanka Coffee. I couldn't make that up if I tried. Sanka Coffee. He says to, to the head, to the main guy, the driver, his friend, he's Darice. He says, Darice. Are you dead, man? And he says, no, I'm, I'm not dead, but I have to finish the race. And those four men climb out of that bobsled, two men in the front and two in the back, and they pick that thing up and put it on their shoulders, and they begin to walk down the raceway, and they make their way across the finish line, and all the people begin to cheer. And at that point, I thought to myself and about the other movie, and in both situations, it, it brought me back to a saying that a friend of mine had told me years earlier, it's not who you are 
that holds you back. You know, so many times we think, well, I'm being held back by who I am or my upbringing or whatever. It's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you're not. Let me go a little deeper with this. So many Christians I've known over the years, they, they, they know who lives within them. They, they know who they belong to, yet they settle for second best. Second best in their lives, second best in their families, second best in their churches. And so often it's because of who they think they're not. Now here's what I mean by this. It's what I call the I'm just syndrome. I am just whatever. I am just a farmer. I am just a factory worker. I am just a simple guy. I am just a housewife. I just cut hair. I didn't go to college. Now, consider the Corinthians. We come to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is actually at least the fourth letter we know that Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth. We, we're pretty sure that 1 Corinthians was actually 2 Corinthians because he makes reference to another letter he'd written them. And so when you put them together, it looks like 2 is 4th and so forth. So it's been a while. So kind of let me set the stage here for you. When, when you look at this from start to finish, it looks like these letters have been pretty rough letters. But the Corinthians have come from an extremely pagan background. They're unsure of themselves. They're unsure of their beliefs. They, they're, they're unsure of, of what actions to take. But by the time we get to 2 Corinthians 7, by the time we get to Titus, by the time Titus gets there, who is a cohort of Paul's, things have changed quite a bit. So much so that Paul could say those words in verse 16 when he says, I rejoice because I have perfect confidence in you. Now that, believe me, is a far cry from the way 1 Corinthians chapter 1 begins, because if you go back and read that, it's very obvious that Paul was very glad that there was little to nothing that would openly identify him with the Corinthians. Things have changed a lot. But what changed? What, what lessons did the Corinthian Christians learn that could so change Paul's opinion of them? Can, can we learn? these lessons? Can we learn that it's not who we are that holds us back? It's who we think we're not. Well, there's three simple lessons here, and this is what we need to pick up today. Number one, don't sell your experiences short. Don't sell your experiences short. Look back at verse 12. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Paul, Paul wrote previous letters, but he's saying, I didn't write them to hurt you. I said some tough things, but I wasn't writing those things or saying those things to injure you. I was trying to help you. He's in essence saying, I knew there was something in you. I knew there was something to you. We just had to get it out in the open. I referred to a couple of movies earlier. There was another series known as the Rocky series. You remember all the Rocky movies. There was Rocky Balboa. He was the street brawler. Uh, he was the guy who literally came up from nowhere. He had nothing going for him other than the fact that he was a tough guy. Things work out. He ends up somehow or another getting himself into a, a boxing match with the heavyweight champion of the world. He loses that first time, but that's so we could have a second movie. Second movie comes along and he wins, and that was so we could have a third movie. We come along in the third movie and things have changed a little bit. He's the champion, but he ends up fighting a guy that's totally different than he's ever seen before. And he, he loses that fight, but not only does he lose that fight, but his manager ends up dying that night, and his whole life turns upside down. Now, suddenly after that, his, his nemesis, his longtime enemy, if you will, Apollo Creed, the guy that he defeated to win the title, comes back and says, I'll train you. So he begins to work with him and train him to face this guy who's just beaten him. And they're working together. They're running on the beach and doing all kinds of things. But, but Rocky, he's just not in it. You can tell there's something not right. And one particular day, they're running along the beach, and he just, he just kind of shuts down. Apollo screams and hollers at him, but he just kind of walks off. And then his wife, Adrian, comes up to him. And she wants to know what's going on. 
She says, look, I don't know what's happening here, but you're not into this and this and that and the other. And finally, Rocky turns and he looks at her and he, he literally yells at her. He says, look, he says, I'm scared. There, I said it. Are you happy? I'm scared. But you know, there's some things that, that just have to be brought out of us. And they have to be brought out of us through experience. You look in the New Testament, look at Peter. Peter was a fisherman. Now, fishermen, fishermen in that day and time were, 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 were strong men. They were, they were mainly men, if you will. They were guys that, that, you know, they maybe didn't know a whole lot about things in life and the world, but they knew how to fish, and they knew how to make things work. He was a tough guy. Jesus comes along, calls him to be one of his disciples. So here's, here's Peter following Christ. And think about the things that happened with him. Here's this guy. He's, he's gathered with the other disciples, and he's the one that makes the great confession. When Jesus says, who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. But now this is the same guy who gets out of the boat when Jesus calls him but falls into the water. Now this is the same guy who when Jesus says that he's going to die on a cross, pulls Jesus aside so he can straighten him out. This is the same guy who goes into the garden and pulls out a sword and in an ill-advised attempt to protect everybody, takes a whack at a guard and takes off his ear. This is the same guy who told Jesus, I'll never deny you, I'll fight with you, I'll fight for you, I'll die with you, I'll die for you. But then he denies three times that he even knows Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. Would you want to live through all of that? Think about it. You really want to go through that? And yet, look at what did God did in his life through those experiences. Because, yes, this is the same guy that God was able to use after that. This is a guy that on the day of Pentecost preaches, and over 3,000 come to know Jesus Christ. This is the same guy who stands before the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel, with James and John, and says, you know, you decide whether it's right or wrong to keep talking in the name of Jesus, but as for us, all we can do is say and speak of what we have seen and heard. We're going to keep on keeping on. This is the same guy that in Acts chapter 15 stands before the Jerusalem council after Paul has spoken to them and says to them, look, one thing I've learned in life, it's that we as Jews come to God the same way that the Gentiles do. Now, he still had issues. Because in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about a run-in he had with Peter, and Peter was wrong. So things still happened, but God used his experiences Changes life. You know, there are folks that grow up dreaming of going to one of the Ivy League schools, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, so forth. There are others that dream about going to some place like Notre Dame. You ever known anybody that went to the school of hard knocks? My guess is some of you have been there. Some of you are there right now. There's nothing wrong with that. That's one of those places that we learn. There are things that you can learn through all of your experiences, both good and bad. There are things that God can teach you through those experiences. See, sometimes you have to be brought down before you can understand what it means to be lifted up. Can God use you? Yes. But whatever you do, don't sell your experiences short. Here's the second thing the Corinthians learned and that we need to learn as well. Don't sell yourself short. You know, I, I've told you before, I, I love, love the game of baseball. I love coaching baseball. But I think the reason I loved coaching baseball so much was, was seeing young people learn to do something that they didn't think they could do. There's something special about that. When I had a chance, the last couple of years I coached, I was coaching a 13 and 14 year old boys team. Had a young man on that team named Tully. Tully. Tully had a problem. Tully wasn't the most athletic kid on the face of the earth. He wasn't the worst, but he certainly wasn't the best. And he, he had a problem. It was known as hitting the ball. Couldn't do it. Now, you've heard and I've heard it said, and, and I think it's probably close to true at least, toughest thing in sports is to hit a baseball. 
There's a, there's a lot of truth to that. You've got this little ball coming at you, and, and you have this piece of wood, at least it's what I had when I was growing up. Now it's a piece of aluminum or metal or composite or polyurethane or something. But, but trying to hit that, that's a tough thing to do. And not just a matter of hitting it, but hitting it where, somewhere where they aren't. I mean, that's the way it has to be done. <clears throat> so I watched Tully one day. We'd gone through about half the season. He just simply, he couldn't foul one off. He couldn't tip one, much less hit one. And we worked and worked and worked. And finally, I realized what was happening. His feet kept moving. When he got in the box, his feet were constantly moving. So if you're constantly moving, you can't get set. And there's no way. Nothing else works after that. So I, I took him and I intentionally took four or five bats and I stacked them behind his last foot, his back foot. And I said, now, hit the ball. And so every time he moved that foot, he'd step on one of those bats and he'd start tripping and falling. And I said, see what's happening? You've got to keep that foot down. And we worked and worked and worked. And we finally had a game about a week later. Put him in. He had two strikes on him. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, here we go again. I mean, I really wasn't very positive. And all of a sudden, he got the pitch and everything worked. His feet stayed down. He turned at his hips. That bat came through. And I saw that bat connect with that ball. And boom, he put one in right field and he had a base head. He went around first base and he was so happy. You'd have thought he had just won the seventh game of the World Series in the bottom of the ninth inning. I mean, it was just one of those kind of things. Because he finally learned how to do that. And looking at that in his eyes, it made such a difference. And, and so here's Paul. Here's Paul and what he's basically saying to the Corinthians as a teacher. He's saying, I knew you could do it. I knew you had it in you. It just had to be pulled out. It just had to be brought out. You know, it blows my mind how many people think there is so much that they can't do. Thomas Edison the great inventor, once said, if we did all the things we're capable of doing, we astound ourselves. There's a lot of truth to that. See, it, it's amazing how often what holds us back is not who we were, not who we are, but who we think we're not, what we think we can't do. Look at Moses. Moses was a fellow that God called. Moses was a fellow, he, he thought he had it figured out. He tried it his way and it didn't work out. He ended up exiled out of Egypt for 40 years. But then one day he has that burning bush experience. He sees the bush burning on the side of the mountain. And so he goes up on the mountain and, and God speaks to him on that mountain. And he tells him, look, I've got plans. I want to send you back to Egypt. I'm going to do things with Pharaoh and I'm going to do things with you. I'm going to work through you and you're going to deliver my people. And, and you would think hearing all this that God is going to do, that that would excite Moses. But if you remember what Moses' response was, I can't. I can't do that. And so God said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll take care of this. And Moses said, well, that's great, but I, I still can't do this. And, and God said, well, I'll take care of that. And Moses said, well, I'm sorry, but I still can't do that. And finally, Moses says, look, I can't even talk right. And finally, God says, look, I will send your brother. Stop saying I can't. Because it's not about what you can't do. It's about what I am going to do through you. But you know what? In spite of all that, in spite of all that God said he was going to do, you know what Moses had to do? Moses had to come down off the mountain and go. He still had to do that. Sarah was a young lady that attended church fairly regularly, but she had never in her life prayed out loud. She'd had an experience where her fiancé had left her, and so she had drawn closer to the church to draw closer to God. <coughs> and she, was, she had a job. She was an ultrasound technician. She got called in to the ER early one morning, about 2 in the morning. And as she, she came in, there was a doctor that came out of the examining room, and he said, look, I don't know what's going on, but I'll tell you, as far as I'm concerned, the lady that's in there is crazy. She's absolutely crazy. But the law requires us to run some tests, so let's just get it done and get it over with. So she walks in there, and she finds this woman. She's in her early 40s. She's highly agitated. She could barely sit still for any kind of ultrasound. She's bouncing off the walls, complaining about intense discomfort and pain. At one point, she even ended up curled up on the floor. I mean, it was that bad. And so finally, as Sarah's struggling to try to get this work done and get the test done, 
the woman cries out to her. She says, do, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And Sarah said, well, yes, I do. And so finally, this woman, for the first time that she's been in there, has a little bit of hope in her eyes. And she looks up at Sarah and she says, would you pray for me? I just need to calm down. Well, Sarah's kind of in a caught spot now. She's in there. She's never done anything like this since she's been following Jesus, but now she's stuck. And so she's fumbling with the machine. She's looking for a way out. And so she's trying to avoid the inevitable. Finally, she looks at the lady and she says, you know, maybe, maybe you could pray or at least get us started. And then the woman looks at her and says, no, it hurts too much. You do it. And so here's Sarah. Never done anything like this before. Right there in the ER, she stretches out her hand, lays it on this lady, and she prayed. And she prayed this simple prayer. God, please be with this woman in her time of need. Please give the doctors wisdom to know what is wrong with her and how to fix it. And God, please put your hands on her and take away her pain. It was short, sweet, but it was just what the great physician ordered woman calmed down. And as she did, Sarah had this sudden inclination. She thought she'd go back and check the gallbladder did again. And when she did, she found wedged in the neck of this woman's gallbladder a four millimeter stone. She went out and told the doctor who was in absolute dismay that anything like that actually existed and quickly called others together and they rushed her off to emergency surgery. All because of Sarah. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't sell yourself short. God can use you. It's not about who you are or who you were, and it's certainly, certainly not about who you think you're not. Don't let that hold you back. God can use you. Don't sell your experiences short. Don't sell yourself short. And whatever you do, don't sell God short. Look back at a verse that we did not read. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter seven, same chapter, but in verse six, it says, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. But God, God, comforted. God strengthened. God did these things. Don't sell God short. You know, back when I was, uh, back in the late 80s when I was in seminary, uh, there was a song, you know, we sang a lot of praise songs, and there was a fellow by the name of Rich Mullins that wrote a song in, back in 1988 called Awesome God. Man, that was a radical <laughs> song back then to sing in church or anywhere. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it, but, but hear the words. I want you to hear the words. When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the Ritz. I have, we had no idea what putting on the Ritz was, but it sounded cool. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that? Do, do you really Believe that because we live in a technologically advanced society today where respected scientists walk out and tell us that heaven is a fairy tale. So do we really believe that? Do we dare to believe that when we read the Word of God, we're reading about the living God, the same God today that we read about here? Do we really believe that? I ask that because I am thoroughly convinced that the biggest obstacle that we face in the church today, in the church today, is lack of belief. No doubt in my mind. 
lack of belief. When Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Paul said, my God shall supply all your needs by his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. How dare us not believe God when we are living and breathing and forgiven as a result of his power. And those things are minor compared to what he can do in people's lives. Look, look at the Corinthians. Look at what he did. Look at how he changed them from point A to point B. Ravi Zacharias, most likely the greatest Christian apologist who's lived up to this point, was recently promoted to heaven. He wrote a book several years ago called Has Christianity Failed You? And he points to one of the greatest proofs of the existence of God being the change and changed lives of Christians. And then he, he, he tells this story. You know, back in the, in the early part of the 20th, earlier 20th century, after destroying all the Christian seminaries and schools and libraries in the country, Chairman Mao of China declared that Christianity had been permanently removed from that country, would never return again. On Easter Sunday, 2009, Leading English language newspaper in Hong Kong published a picture of Tiananmen Square on page one. And in that picture, Jesus, a picture of Jesus replaced the picture of Chairman Mao on this gigantic banner. And the words, Christ is risen, were written below it. Now China's trying it again. Guess what? They're not going to succeed any more now than Mao did then. Don't sell God short. Don't sell your experiences short. Don't sell yourself short. But whatever you do, don't sell God short. He can use you. You know, Caleb and Joshua were two of the 12 spies that were sent out by Moses into the promised land. They were the two positive ones. The other 10 came back and, you know, they had the same report basically as Joshua and Caleb did. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough area and there's some tough people there and there's big forts and fortified cities and big people and so forth. But the 10 said, we can't take it. But Joshua and Caleb said, oh, yes. Yeah, all those things are true, but God is with us. We can take it. Well, you remember what happened. Everyone listened to the 10. And Israel ended up wandering the wilderness for 40 years. But the time came, long after that generation was gone, there were two men left, basically, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was leading Israel. And as they were beginning their move into the promised land, and they did all the things that God had called them to do. In Joshua chapter 14, I love it, where... Caleb comes, and, and basically this is kind of my summary of it. He comes to, to, to Joshua, and he says, Joshua, everything that God said would happen has happened. He's kept me alive these 40-some-odd years, and now here we are in the promised land. All these years later, I'm 85 years old now, but you know what? I'm just as strong as I was back then. I can, I can make war. I can deal with all these things. I can plant. I can work through things. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to go and to come. So he says, now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke of on that day. Give me what God promised me. Give me the hill country. I want you to give me the toughest area out there. Yeah, that's what I want. You know why? Because God's going to work through me and we're going to take it. Give it to me. He says, God's going to be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. You, you can do so much more. You can be so much more. For, forget expectations. Forget what everybody else says. Don't 
settle for second best. Don't sell your experiences short. Don't sell yourself short. And whatever you do, don't sell God short. Remember this. It, it's not who we are that holds us back. It's who we think we're not. And you know what? That doesn't matter. What matters is if you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, all things are possible. Father, we come before you throne of grace as people who want to make a difference. There are some here this morning who do not know you. And they feel helpless. They feel useless. Their lives feel pointless. But all of that can change. You have a place for them in your kingdom. You love them. And you made all of that possible because you have sent your son Jesus Christ to take their place, to die on a cross for them, to rise again. You can use them. Father, I pray for those here today that do not know you, give them the courage to pray this prayer to you right now. Dear God, I know you love me. And I know you have a place for me. And I know you want to use me. I pray right now that Jesus Christ would come into my life. I give my life to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Father, I pray for those that just pray that prayer or a prayer like that. Give them the courage to come to one of us and share that with us, that we can have the opportunity to tell them what has just happened and what's going to happen in their lives. The fact that they now belong to you and that you can and will make a difference through their lives. Father, I pray for those here today that are Christians. They have that relationship. But, Father, too many times we settle for second best or in reality much further down the line than that because we listen to the world. We don't listen to you. Father, I pray we would realize you can use us. We, we can't afford to sell our experiences short. We can't afford to sell ourselves short. We certainly can't afford to sell you short. Father, you can use us. You can make a difference through us if we'll just let you do it. It's not about who we think we're not. It's about who we belong to. Father, we love you and we praise you. And we pray that you would use us to make a difference in this world for the kingdom of God. For it's in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. We got a video. Okay, just like to ask you to watch a, a brief video with us and then now have an even briefer word than that after. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum and you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're gonna look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right Now Media. It's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. 
We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. Okay, so Right Now Media is a, a resource, a digital resource online that has all kinds of video uh, presentations that are fantastic. I mean, some of them are just like blow your mind good. And from, from trusted and well-known teachers and some newer teachers as well and speakers that can help tremendously in your Christian walk, help you to understand the Bible, help you to understand how to apply it, help you to navigate some of the difficulties that you may be experiencing. You're struggling with a, a, a difficulty in a relationship of some kind, whether it's as a parent or as a, a spouse or a friend. There's stuff in Right Now Media to help you with that. Are you struggling to understand the book of Ephesians accurately? There's something in here to help you with that. And everything in between. There are over 10,000 resources available um, and this is something that I'm just going to give you some props, sister, if you don't mind. Marley drew to my attention um, several weeks back, probably a few months ago, actually now, by the time this is all come and gone. And I know some of you probably already have subscriptions, but our church is extending to you the offer of a free subscription to everyone um, and we'll get more into how you can even use that as a tool to share the gospel um, as, as days pass by. But if you'll check your inbox, uh, your, your email, if you receive email from the church, an invitation should have hit your inbox this morning around 9 a.m., and it probably will be from me, and it very well may be in your junk mail or spam. So check those places if you don't find it. Also available are other ways to join, and if you'll just take your bulletin this morning and open it and look, take your bulletin, open it, and look in the, on the left side, um, that big orange, I guess that's called a banner. Is that a banner? Is that big enough to be a banner? Okay, it's a banner. It says Right Now Media on it. And there are uh, three ways to join on there in addition to the email the invitation that you received. So four ways. And you can even use, if you want to feel really advanced, use the QR code, man. It's empowering. Use the QR code, the box with the squiggly lines. You train your, your um, smartphone camera on that, and it will pop up a link for you, and you can join right there. There's an app available as well. Just want to encourage you, take part in this. It is a free subscription, no strings attached of any kind, and it will give you opportunities uh, in the coming days to share Christ with some of your friends and family in a new way as well. If you need any help at all, uh, getting your subscription or knowing how to navigate around in there. Uh, if you want suggestions, what should I look at first? I'll be glad to help you out with that as well. So give me a holler, holler at Jody um, or any of the church staff as we continue to become more acquainted with this in the coming days and months. All right, cool. Let's stand and sing as we leave. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. God bless you. Hope to see you tonight.